So yes, so I work here in Dundee in uh, the Centre for Anatomy and Human Identification and uh, the primary work that we're involved in is to do with forensic human identification. But obviously a lot of the techniques that we use also get um, utilised within the archaeology world and depicting faces of uh, the past, from the past, um, is a particular fascination, I think, with individuals that they like to be able to see who they're talking about from the past as well. So um, that's the basis of the work. I thought I would give you a bit of context and tell you how we do some of the work that we do and, and why we do it. And then I'll end by showing you um, some cases, uh, primarily from Scotland, but I will sadly end with Richard III because I know that everybody <laughs> likes to see him even if he is an English king. Um, oh, hold on a second, bear with me until I work out how to do this. That one, right? Yeah, that should be. Oh, whoops. Oh, far too fast. Okay, we've got it, thank you. Uh, so really the, the context of, of what we do is related to how important our faces are in relation to identity. So when we look at somebody, when we look at their face, without speaking to them, we get a lot of information about who they are. So very quickly we can tell by looking at somebody whether they're male or female. We can usually do that within a couple of seconds. We can make a pretty good estimation, in most cases, of the age of an individual or the rough age of an individual by looking at their face. We can tell something about their ancestry or their ethnic group. We may get some indication of their culture or their religion, depending on whether they choose to present that uh, in their face as well. We may get some indication of their personality in relation to how they modify their face uh, and how they present it to other people. Uh, we use our faces for identification on a daily basis. We're very good at distinguishing between individuals by looking at them and looking at their faces and recognising them. And we record the faces of individuals as a way of uh, identifying people we don't know. So, for example, through passport images or offender photographs when people are arrested, etc. And I'm sure you will use um, software on your computers that will, if you want it to, tag all the photographs that you have on your computer and tell you who they are. So, it's, it's, faces are incredibly important in terms of personal identification. From my point of view, the interesting question is how much of that information can we see by looking at the skull? So we know that the skull will give us a certain degree, usually with less certainty than from the face, but we can tell whether an individual was male or female by looking at the, the structure of their skull. We can get an indication of how old the person was, roughly, again, usually by looking at the state of their teeth. Uh, we can get some indication of ancestry. We might see signs of culture and personality, depending on if that, the skull has been modified in any way. So this image here is the skull of somebody from South America. And what they've done when the, the, this individual was a child is it will have had, had its head bound so that it changes the shape of the cranium. And this was done because it was considered attractive for no other reason and had no effect on the individual in terms of their ability. Um, we may also see trauma and disease that will give us an indication of how that person looked as well if it, if it le left permanent marks. Uh, but from my point of view, what's, what's more interesting than this, although this is very interesting, is if we can look at an individual skull and tell what the person actually looked like, what their face shape was like. And if we can do that, then that get, enables us to be able to uh, see the appearance of individuals from the past and also to help people, current individuals who are unknown in forensic investigations, become identified. Uh, the work that we do is primarily based on anatomical assessment. So we look at the detail of the skull and we use that to predict the shape of the face and the, the shape of facial features. Um, we use most of the work that we do now is based in the computer. This was traditionally done with clay or plasticine on a copy of the skull, but of course everything has gone into the digital world now. So we use um, three-dimensional digital technology to give us the structures of the face and, and to predict the facial appearance. 
Um, you may have seen this case. This is a, a, a recent forensic case from Edinburgh of a, a lady's body that was found and eventually identified through the reconstruction work. Um, and this is the primary reason that we do uh, facial reconstruction, as it's known, or approximation or depiction. Um, and that's for, to help um, in this, usually in cases where the police really have no idea, no clues as to who the, the individual is. And then it can be used as a tool for recognition. So this isn't a form of identification. It's not legally accepted as a way of identifying someone. What it is is a tool for recognition so that uh, the police will get names and then from those names they can identify the individual. So really it's about trying to present a face that, that is recognisable to people who would have known that individual. But of course we've also used um, this within the world of archaeology, as I said, for creating the faces of people from the past. Um, if any of you have watched the History Cold Case programme that was from Dundee, then you will have seen some of the more recent examples of that with our digital technology and uh, CGI. So this is the process. You can see um, on the on the left-hand side is the uh, digital three-dimensional system, and on the right-hand side, the traditional clay. It's exactly the same process, regardless of whether it's digital or not, in that the anatomical structures, primarily the muscles, are built directly onto the skull, and then those tissue de depth pegs that you can see give us some indication of the average amount of tissue over and above the muscle structure, and that enables us to build a face from the skull to the surface. Um, the, the standards that we use and the prediction methods that we use were traditionally based on human dissection, on anthropometry, which is measuring of skulls and faces, and also palpation studies, which is feeling someone's face and feeling the structures underneath. Um, but of course, in recent years, over the last 20 years really, um, we've had access to clinical images in a much more um, available way. So we can use CT data of living individuals, MR scans, X-rays, uh, ultrasound, are all the methods that we use now for visualising the skeletal structure and in some cases the skeletal structure and the uh, soft tissues as well. So that, that has allowed us to develop much more accurate methods of predicting facial features from skeletal assessment. So we use regression formula, we take measurements, um, we uh, follow these prediction standards, um, and some of them are pretty good now. Um, it, traditionally, the nose was a very difficult area for us to predict because it's mostly cartilage. There's not very much bone. Uh, it was always very difficult. It was thought of as being the most uh, inaccurate area of the face. But because we've been able to look at CT data of living individuals, the nose is now the most accurate area of the face because we have really good standards that we can use that have been tested a number of times for predicting nasal shape from the nasal aperture shape. Um, probably the most frequently asked question to me is how accurate is this? Are we just making it up? Or can we see um, how, how well we produce a face, how much it looks like an individual? Now, we can do that with forensic cases, so when the person is identified, we can then compare it with the face. But, of course, then we're just looking at the successful ones. And, of course, they look like them because somebody put their name forward. So we're kind of biasing our results if we only look at forensic cases. Uh, but, again, with the development of clinical imaging, we've been able to... Um, look at living individuals, uh, and in this case, um, people who donate their bodies for forensic science, has enabled us to be able to do a reconstruction of someone. We know what they look like, we've got photographs of them, we don't know when we do the reconstruction, and then we can compare it directly with the face when the reconstruction is finished. And that allows us to test the methods that we use. So these are some of those cases. Uh, this case of donated individuals, and then these from living individuals from CT data. So it's possible for me to take um, CT data of you, do a reconstruction of that, and then compare it directly with your face um, when you're alive. And, and because more and more people are CT scanned, um, usually for clinical reasons, we, we're not allowed to just take anybody in and CT scan them, much to my sadness, um, but we do get a lot of dental data that's given to us, and that enables us to be able to test these methods time and time again. So we know exactly how accurate we are in terms of predicting shape. 
we know that about 70% of the surface of the face has less than two millimetres of error in terms of facial depiction. So we know exactly how accurate we are. And we aim to get more and more accurate with those techniques as well. Um, so at the shape point of view, we're pretty confident in our ability to be able to, to predict shape from skeletal assessment. And it's possible in the computer world now to wrap very realistic textures around that 3D shape to make it look like a living individual. So we can add skin textures and eye textures. We might be able to add more complicated textures like hair, wrinkles, disease, etc., so that the, the face becomes more and more believable and more and more realistic. The problem for us is that anything from then onwards is guessing. So we have no information about skin colour from the bones. We have no information about hair colour and eye colour, although that may be coming with some DNA results. Um, but we, we really have no idea about those textures. And those textures are incredibly important in terms of recognition. So whilst we might get shape right and feel confident about that, these textures can make all the difference to recognition levels. Um, so this is a colleague... Um, Michael Bromby, he's called, from Edinburgh University. He looks like neither of these images in reality. Uh, he got a makeup artist to give him different wigs and different facial hair wigs. Uh, there are no prosthetics involved here at all. So the shape of his face is exactly the same in both images, but he looks like two different people because of those, dif those different textures. So we know that if we put those textures onto a head and we get it wrong, hugely wrong in this case, so if you knew him as he looked with the beard and glasses and the reconstruction went out with the curly wig, then you might not recognise him because it looks so. that's enough to make that face look quite different, having those different textures. But we also know that if we don't have any texture, then it's quite difficult to recognise a face as well. Does anybody know who this is? This is somebody you all know. It's me, yeah. So this is, a, this is a laser scan of my face. And I showed this to my daughter when she was about 12, and she didn't recognize it as being me. So it is incredibly difficult to recognize faces without that important texture in skin and eyes and hair, etc. Hair less so, but certainly the rest of it, it, it does make it extremely difficult to recognise somebody even if they're a member of your family and you know them really well. Now we do know that people who've got very characteristic faces are easier to recognise without texture. So these two you're probably more likely to get than the one of me. Stephen Fry. Stephen Fry, yeah. And the top one? Yeah, Angelina Jolie. So people who've got very characteristic features like Angelina Jolie's big lips and well, Stephen Fry is quite characteristic and wonky in lots of ways, isn't he? So that makes it very re him very recognisable as well. But most of us are closer to the average. So it makes it very difficult for us to get a recognition by, adding by not having any texture at all. So we do need to add something, but if we add it and it's very wrong, then both of those things might um, decrease recognition. The other thing we have difficulty with is the representation of age. So we know how people's faces change as they get older, and we can predict that. We know exactly why it happens from an anatomical and a physiological point of view, and we can look at someone's face and predict what will happen to it because of the shape of it and, and the relationship between the skin elasticity and sagging of flesh and all those hideous things that happen as you get older. Uh, we can predict that. We know how, why, that, why and how that happens. The problem is that we don't know when it happens. So the people on the top row and the people on the bottom row are within 10 years of each other in terms of age, uh, but some have aged better than others. <laughs> and that will be related to a number of factors, to your genetic inheritance, to your lifestyle choices, to how much sun damage you have, whether you smoke, whether you sleep on your back or your front. All of these things will have a massive effect in terms of your ageing. It's better to sleep on your back than your front, by the way. Uh, you get less wrinkles. Um, so, although we, we might know we want to represent a 50-year-old, we don't know whether they're a 50-year-old who looks like a 50-year-old, or a 50-year-old who looks like a 70-year-old, or a 50-year-old who looks like a 30-year-old. And that makes it quite difficult for us, because we're guessing, again, as to how much age-related change there'll be to their face, 
but we have to represent age because that can be very important in terms of recognition as well. So it's probably fair to say that a reconstruction of a young adult will be more accurate than a reconstruction uh, with increased age because the older somebody is, the more we're guessing in terms of those textures to their face. Um, the other thing we don't really know about is how much weight someone is carrying, and I had a conversation with a lady earlier about that. Um, with the, all of the reconstruction work that we do, we go for the average because that's, what, that's the only thing we can do. But of course, someone may be slightly heavier or, or, or less heavy than the average, and with obesity and emaciation, it would be difficult for us to know that from the skeleton. In some cases, you might, but it's quite difficult. So we work on the assumption that if you know somebody very well, then you would recognize them even with a, a bit of a loss of weight or a bit of a gain of weight. Um, but of course, that's very different in, within the world of archaeology. And then we have to work from the uh, suggestions of the archaeologists and the historians as to how much weight we're likely to be um, presenting. So in a forensic case, this is usually how they'll go out to the police, this kind of image. So they'll be black and white because we're not then estimating skin colour or hair colour or eye colour, but we can still give a suggestion of tone. Uh, we tend to try and focus on the areas of the face that we're, we have a lot of confidence in, so the centre of the face, and we tend to blur out the outside um, in relation to the hair and those features that we're less certain of. Uh, if we put out bald reconstructions, people don't respond to them very well. People don't like them, but they also think that we're suggesting the person is bald, and that's quite difficult to get around. So we have to put some hair in place, um, but of course we don't know what the hairstyle is like, so it has to be blurred and quite vague. And with male faces, um, we find that there's a lot of evidence, psychology evidence, to suggest that you can actually chop the top of the head off and it doesn't matter in terms of recognition. So we often do that as well, um, because uh, that's an area that we're guessing quite a lot in. Now, obviously, within archaeology, we have a bit more artistic license. In, in the forensic world, what we're trying to do is to get a recognition. So the, the more it looks like the individual, the more it's likely to be recognized and identified. Within, within archaeology, we're trying to present the most likely appearance of somebody rather than try and get a recognition. So we can afford to have a bit more artistic license. We can use hairstyles that are typical from that period of time, from that part of the world, from somebody of that status that's suggested by archaeologists. Um, we can um, use typical hairstyles that are from texts, and if there are images or drawings, then obviously we can use those to tell us the clothing and, and other artifacts that people may have or wear or modify their bodies. Um, so we work a lot with historians and archaeologists to give us that texture information that we're not getting from the skeleton. Um, in terms of the cases that we've worked on, sometimes it's famous people from, from history um, rather than uh, us, the usual people. We do, we do look at that as well. Um, so we've done some cases with um, people who are known, like uh, Robert Burns. Um, this was a depiction that we did from the cast of the skull um, that's housed in a number of uh, museums. This, this cast up here, this is a laser scan of the cast, when this was done, um, scientists were only interested in phrenology, in you know, lumps and bumps on the cranium. So they didn't actually bother casting all of it, which is a shame. They, they only got it down to the nose. Uh, so we used the, the portraits, um, the side profile portraits, to give us the rest of the um, proportions of the face um, and estimated the mandible using orthodontic standards. So it, and we used the portraits as well. This was, this was less about us trying to show exactly what it looked like and using as much information as possible to do a depiction. Um, I think I've upset half of Scotland with this and the other half are quite pleased, so it's, you know, that seems like a good deal for me. Um, also some infamous faces as well as famous ones. This is uh, the work of one of our students. Um, he did a facial depiction of William Burke, uh, whose remains are housed in Edinburgh in the Anatomical Museum. Um, and he used a, a life mask, a death mask and the skull uh, and the text information written about him from the time describing his appearance to uh, produce a, a three-dimensional head of him. S five minutes, okay. So sometimes we, we do work when we don't have a skull. Bear with me. 
Uh, and one of those cases is this one, is St. Nicholas. So um, St. Nicholas's remains are in the cathedral in Bari, uh, but you're not allowed access to them and it's sealed up. But they did a number of studies in the 50s and took a lot of very good photographs and measurements from the skull. So what we did for St. Nicholas is we recreated his skull in 3D in the computer based on the photographs and the measurements of the skull and then produced a facial depiction um, from that 3D skull that was made. Interesting thing about St. Nicholas is that he had a severely broken nose at least twice and I believe he's quite well known for getting into fights so that obviously worked well. Um, a CGI company gave him the textures which may or may not be right um, and the BBC gave him a big white beard but I won't show you that one. Um, Mary Queen of Scots as you've heard we also produced a depiction of her now of course we don't have a skull of Mary Queen of Scots so um, and the reason that this was done was because there were no existing portraits of Mary um, from the period of time when she lived in Scotland so all the portraits that exist are either from when she lived in France before she came to Scotland or when she was in captivity in England and the museum wanted a depiction of her as she looked when she lived in Scotland so what we did was we used the portraits to create a three-dimensional model and, and luckily there's enough of them from slightly different views that enabled us to be able to do that. And then using what we knew about her life in Scotland, which was really quite grim, uh, we know she had a long period of illness and she miscarried and she may have been raped and there was a, you know, the political situation going on um, with Elizabeth. So we wanted to show that in her face and, and to depict her with wrinkles and... Um, she was very young, but uh, having a very stressful life. Um, and you can see how the 3D model was matched up to the portrait so that we got it as close as possible to all of them. And some of those portraits we know were drawn very accurately because of the um, reputation of the artist. Um, of course, we do lots of reconstructions of people who are not famous, who are unknown, that have no name, that come from archaeological um, investigations around the UK. Um, and some of those are presented in museums and some of them um, have been on television shows. Um, the one at the top um, left there is from Elgin Museum, is a South American um, bundle body that's housed in um, Elgin Museum. So we did a CT scan. It's in a big glass dome, which is why you can see that dome around it. Um, we can sometimes use the depictions to depict disease and trauma. So um, this image here is from a knight from Stirling Castle, a medieval knight who had this healed wound uh, on the forehead um, that was used in the depiction. Um, the one in the middle is from the Battle of Towton. Um, um, and this is a, a hit, it, sorry, this one here is a healed wound on the lower jaw, at least 10 years old, that wound, so it was also incorporated into his appearance. And then this one is syphilis from London, tertiary syphilis. What we tend to do is to show wounds that someone lived with rather than the wounds that killed them, because that would be inappropriate. And what we're trying to show is their living appearance. So if they had wounds that healed, then obviously we'll include that. We sometimes also work with ancient Egyptian mummies um, and what um, mummified bodies give us is a lot of more information about the soft tissues than we would ordinarily get from just the skeleton. So you often get a lot of information about ears, which we don't know very much about from the skull. This is Ramesses II, a nice little movie showing him before and after. Um, well, after and before, I guess. <laughs> Um, and then finally, Richard III, which I'll tell you briefly about. I'm, I'm sure you all um, are well aware of this uh, particular investigation that happened in Leicester and the, with the king being found in the car park. Um, the, the work that we did was related to the CT scan. So I've never actually been in the same room as the remains of Richard III. Um, everything I got was digital, so I got photographs and CT scans that we could work from. We have a great haptic device system. Our, our computer system has haptic feedback, which means that I can feel what I'm touching on the computer screen, which is way too difficult to describe to you, but fantastic. And that means that even though I haven't been in the same room as Richard III's remains, I felt his skull. How cool is that? <laughs> so these are the photographs and CT scan of his skull. When we got involved in this, um, I obviously knew where this had come from, so um, we, we knew that it was strongly suspected that this was Richard III, but when we did the reconstruction, 
Uh, the DNA analysis had not come back, so we didn't know for definite that this was him. And I knew that I was going to have to justify all the decisions that I made in terms of the face, so we repeated this process twice so that we followed all of the anatomical process. And I can tell you exactly why, if you're really interested, why all of the features are exactly the way they are. Um, but then when, when obviously the DNA results came back, then that's when we used the portraits to produce the textures. Um, so the CT scan, this one has got a bit of soil on it, which is why it looks a bit, a bit messy. Uh, but we did use the one that was cleaned up as well. So you can see the process, exactly the same method as we use for any of the reconstructions. And actually for him, there was nothing really remarkable about his skull. Um, I mean, it's remarkable that it's Richard III, but that's it really. There's not, he's not got any trauma other than the trauma that killed him, which we don't do. Um, there's nothing significant about him, nothing particularly different. And, and so the, the standards that we used are relatively straightforward. It was very typically white European, um, definitely male, fitted the right age group um, in terms of being in the 30s. You can see the relationship between the face and the skull on the bottom and the, the <coughs> anatomical structure at the top. Um, this is the finished head in the computer, so this is just shape. We can choose whatever colour we like in the computer. This, we choose this because it's a nice one to visualise shape, but it could be sky blue, pink with yellow dots on. We can do whatever we like. Um, after this, then it was 3D printed um, using stereolithography and plastic. So this is like a plastic copy of the head. And then I, I worked with a portrait artist called Janice Aitken at the College of Art who then painted this up and, and we put prosthetic eyes in and a wig, etc. When this stage was done, we used the portraits. So we took the texture information, even though neither of these portraits were done whilst he was alive. We, this is the only information we had, so we used the texture information of his eyes and skin and hair from these. And... Um, and put real hair on the eyebrows and on the eyelashes. And then Janice's mum made this nice little outfit for him to match up. Um, and the hat actually is the hat that Laurence Olivier wore in the BBC Shakespeare production that was given to us for, by the BBC. Um, and you can see for yourself, I'm sure you've seen it before anyway, that there are very sim a lot of similarities between the reconstruction and both of the portraits. Interestingly, one very brief last thing, I also did this, which is to superimpose the skull with the portraits. This is something we do sometimes with anti-mortem images to identify people in forensic cases to match up the skull to the face. And, and actually, this, this, I would positively identify him if that was a photograph with this, because the photograph, the, the portraits of the skull, sorry, the proportions of the skull match up so well to the proportions of the portrait that that's really quite remarkable. Less so with this one, uh, that one, but this one matches up amazingly well in terms of position of features, shape of the jawline, shape of the cranium. Um, considering neither of these portraits were done whilst Richard III was alive, it, although they may have been done from other sketches that were, that's pretty remarkable for me. And it also gives a bit more for me in terms of me believing that this is Richard III, although... I believe the DNA is pretty conclusive anyway. Anyway, thank you very much. I'll leave you with the last thought that in the future it might be you and uh, I'm happy to answer any questions. Thank you. <laughs>